Hi, everybody. All right, can you guys hear me? Somebody say yes, yes. I hope they can. Um, yes, thanks. All right, so. I'm not sure what you guys can see. Let me, oh, I see. Okay, that's not the one. Too many windows open. What what can you guys see? Can you can you see this Math Seven Five Zero Two say the website? Okay, great. And now and now you see the quiz one. Perfect. So I think quiz one should just be on there. You can look at it. Uh, let the quiz conditions begin. Oh, sorry, quiz two. So we're in the quiz two site, right? This is quiz two now. So you go to Math 7502, quiz two, you go to the bottom here. There's no solution. This is a broken link, but uh, there's the quiz. That link should be active. So go ahead and get organized on this quiz. Here it is. Oh wait, or is my screen sharing paused? Something's, something's paused. Come on. Okay, now you can probably see the screen share. Anyway, so go to quiz two. Uh, let me know if you can have it and let the quiz conditions begin and we'll start in, uh, well, this is kind of a slow start. You're officially starting it five uh, or at the round hour, five Brisbane time in three minutes. But um, you could start now and uh, have a read and at 5.10, so that's in uh, 12 minutes from now, we will uh, get questions. So uh, any questions about something that's not clear or not readable, or if you have some ambiguity, the usual. Uh, the conditions are like last time. Please only use your formula sheet. Don't communicate with anybody. Don't consult with anybody. Uh, don't use any other computation tools except for a calculator, even though you basically don't need a calculator here either. And good luck. Oh, uh, so the, and the time for quiz two is, is by uh, 6.30. So I'll, I'll go online in 6.10 and uh, so that's uh, 130 minutes. That includes the time of uploading. Uh, please make sure the upload is clean. As many of you did last time, please make sure you have the name. Some of you didn't upload the name last time. Uh, and of course you're recording, which is always nice to hear. Um, so the quiz link, let me put it, oh, why is this, I see, sorry, this is not, why are we looking at this uh, quiz link?
is on the quiz two site, which is here. Well, put it in the chat as well. So you got the link in the chat. No problem. Now, just a note, uh, I mean, I'll say this again at 510. So when you're executing Graham Schmidt, this is gonna be, require some fraction arithmetic. Uh, so you just need a bit, I mean, you can do this with uh, decimal points, but it's be better just to stay exact in the sense that you just take the square root of uh, the sum of the squares of the vector to get a norm. So you're gonna get these square roots in the denominator. So you're gonna have to do a bit of, a bit of, a, a bit of kind of basic algebra with arithmetic like that. Uh, so just be wary, you be prepared to kind of do some common denominators and things like that. Not too much, but uh, it'll require just a bit. Okay, good luck. Uh, I'll see you in 10 minutes for questions.
All right, everybody. So uh, I'll answer questions in just under a, in just a minute. Uh, if you have any questions about if something's not clear in what's uh, in the quiz, if if you started racing on one of the items and maybe stop and just make sure that you can understand the whole thing. Um, and please let me know if anything's not clear. So yeah, go ahead and say your questions or type them if you have any. Maybe it's all super clear, which it should be. No questions? Can you guys hear me? Can I get an indication that somebody at least heard me now just to see that I'm not on some mute of sorts? Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I'm assuming there are no questions. So good luck and uh, by 6.30 p.m. to the normal email address, just like the last quiz and uh, good luck. Again, I'm telling you, you'll need with the Graham Schmidt, uh, the two Graham Schmidt questions to uh, be diligent and uh, do a bit of fraction arithmetic, et cetera. It's better to do that as opposed to work with uh, floating point numbers with approximate decimal points because there'll be square roots involved. Okay. Good luck. Okay, hi everybody. So, um, can you hear me? Are you there? Are you alive? Yes, uh, let's do just a bit of a quiz um, questionnaire. Quick one, hold on. So, I just need to set up here one more sec, sorry. So how is a quiz if uh, 10 is very hard and uh, one is very easy? Can you just throw some numbers in the chat? 10 is very hard. Um, and uh, of course, yeah, don't feel free to just say what you think. Okay, five is kind of good. Okay, seven, good, okay. There's probably, a, so it's seven. Um, 
So I guess some of the hardship is maybe, um, so who found the hardship due to um, just the fact that you need to work with a lot of uh, kind of arithmetic of square roots in the denominator and things like that? Is that was that part of the trouble? Uh, yeah, the calculating is hard. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. So you actually found it. In, uh, so who found who found uh, in terms of time? So if um, who found that there was lack of time? Just write why, why, why. Yes, yes, yes. If you had, if you felt there was some lack of time. Tight. Okay. I see. Okay. Um, I'll take that into consideration. So one thing I don't like is quizzes with uh, with lack of time. And I guess you don't either. Uh, okay, still, I hope you're okay in the general sense. And as we do after the quiz, and we'll do this after the third quiz as well, um, we'll, be, we'll be dealing with uh, with an application um, and that, that's what we're going to do. So um, I think after the last quiz you saw the perceptron, uh, which is nice, okay, that's okay, the perceptron, uh, but now we're going to deal with an application that's really at the heart of the material. Um, it's really at the core of the material and that application is uh, least squares and least squares data fitting. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in the next uh, 53 minutes. Uh, and in a sense, this is kind of um, one of the most important things that you can uh, you can do as a data scientist. Um, okay, so let's let's get going. Please interrupt with uh, not interrupt. Please just ask questions uh, as always. Um, okay, right. So I also got one more comment that the the first Graham Schmidt was now. If the second Gram Schmidt was much easier, I think in retrospect I should have flipped the Gram Schmidts. Um, but okay. So, and anyway, you'll you'll see the full solution both online and in the um, in the practical this week, uh, together with some discussion on on assignment one and assignment two, which should be out. Um, I remind you, this course does not have a final exam, and I also remind you that the uh, quiz scores is the best two scores. So we take your three quiz scores and replace the worst one with the second worst one. Okay, um, so the purpose of the quiz is just to get some baseline. Okay, let's share this again, um, and let's speak about where we were. So last week we, we did we did a variety of things uh, dealing with projections and such and um, just so we 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 see something so so if we have a matrix A um, and let's take for now A to be M by N okay then the projection matrix associated with A was uh, A times A transposed A inverse A transposed and this matrix exists if um, A is skinny full rank. Okay, so it exists in the sense that this, uh, that this um, inverse exists, okay? Because the null space of the matrix A is the null space of the matrix A transpose A. And if A is skinny full ranks, it means that the columns are linearly independent and hence the column of this are linearly independent. Okay, so that was projection and that's fine. Uh, is, proje is a projection matrix a square matrix, by the way? Projection matrix is square matrix? Is P square? Yeah, it's square because it, it it takes us in the same space. It takes us from the uh, from the space R n to R n. Okay, so it's it's an it's an n by n matrix. Okay, uh, now we could have also written the projection matrix as um, as A applied to this matrix uh, A dagger. Let me redo this dagger just so it's very daggery. A dagger. Uh, where a dagger, the more Penrope pseudo inverse is just a transposed a inverse a transposed. Okay, and in a sense, for us as data scientists, this a dagger is really the 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 critical matrix, 
because this is a matrix that, uh, that resolves least squares. And today we're going to see it uh, kind of as an application to data fitting. And you'll see how to fit a cloud, uh, how to see it fit a line through a cloud of points. That cloud can be very high dimensional as well. Many of you have seen this in linear regression, et cetera, and other means, but um, you know, this is kind of, the, this is really the heart of it. So the, the basic story that, that you have here is that you have a system of equations. So we're not speaking, speaking about data fitting just yet. You, ha you have a system of equations, AX equals B, okay? AX equals B. Where again, A is skinny full rank, okay? Well, later in the course, after the break, we'll deal with a situation where A is not skinny, skinny full rank, okay? With the, with the more general things. But A is skinny full rank. And uh, we're, we're in this situation, but we are not lucky. What does it mean that we're not lucky? B is not in the row space of A, okay? B is not a linear combination of A. Now, this is gonna happen every time that we have, uh, so if I, if I, let me just write here, I'll write here, I'll, I'll, I'll write AX equals B in a slightly different way. I'll write it like A, like this A, this is a matrix A, and this is the vector X, and this is the vector B. Remember, A is skinny. I mean, it's not ultra skinny in this case, it's just skinny, okay? There's no such thing as ultra skinny, just skinny, okay? And basically what we have here is we have, this is an equation, right? This equation takes this A times this X is equals this B. And this is a second equation. And this is a third equation. This, so how many equations do we have? A is M by N. How many equations do we have? M. We have M equations, right? So we have M equations, M equations. And how many unknowns do we have? Obviously unknowns n. So we have n unknowns, but m is greater than n. Okay, that's the skinniness of this guy. All right, so the system is over determined. Now this is going to happen every time you're speaking about systems that have measurements and you're taking more measurements than exactly needed. And that's often the case. You know, a GPS, for example, GPS on the phone requires, I think, to get an exact position for measurements, so four measurements from satellites. But at any given time, the GPS chip can take about eight or nine measurements from different GPSs, and it has more measurements. So one option is, of course, to throw away the extra measurements just to, so how would we throw away? We'll just go and we'll just kind of delete this bottom bit here and delete this bottom bit here so we have a square system of equations. But that's a bit wasteful because we want to fuse this information. We want to use it. Okay? So the system is overdetermined, and uh, we can still do something. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, look for an x that minimizes the minimize x in R n of a x minus b. And this is called least squares minimization. So we're going to minimize this guy. Okay. Now, again, when you see a norm, you already know in this course, unless we explicitly say otherwise, it's a two norm. This two up here is not the two norm. This is squaring the norm. So what we're doing here is we're minimizing the sum of squares. Okay. We're minimizing the sum of squares. Okay. Now, this minimization is equivalent to minimization of x in Rn of Ax minus B, of the actual distance between the left-hand side of the system and the equation, and the right-hand side. But the square function, if you, if you draw here the square, this is kind of, this is U and this is U squared. The square function is a monotonic function and we're only sticking in it a norm, a norm is non-negative. So we're only sticking in it things that are on the positive right-hand side, okay? So when you're doing, the minimization of this, this, the, it has a different value than this, but the argument, the x that minimizes this guy is the same as the x that minimizes this guy. And we like to work with this guy because it's mathematically convenient, okay? So the idea is, well, we can't fit x exactly, so let's find the x that minimizes this sum of squares, okay? That's what we've got. 
Now, next week, when you're not tired from a tough quiz, etc., <coughs> just before we start with eigenvalues, by the way, this is where we're going next week. Eigenvalues is kind of the second part of linear algebra, and then singular value decompositions and things like that. And then you have a break. Okay. So just just we st before we start with eigenvalues, etc., we'll actually see that if you write if you if you define the function f of x as this guy, ax minus b squared, which by the way, I can just write as ax minus b transpose times ax minus b, okay? f is a function from rn to r, okay? And this is, you'll be dealing with this for the rest of your career, this is called a loss function, okay? Have you already heard about loss functions in other courses? Data 7001. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you you want to you want to you want to minimize this loss function. Okay. You want to minimize this loss function. So one way to minimize things is to do some calculus. Okay. And what you can do is you can create, calculate the gradient of this function. Okay. So the gradient of this function is a vector which the gradient of the function at the point x, okay? So you think of you're in the space of x and you calculate the gradient of the function. And the gradient is a vector which has here d, dx1 of f of x. D, sorry, maybe I should use like a partial derivative. D, dx2 of f of x. Up to d, dxn of f of x. Okay, that's a gradient. Now we'll do this next week, but you can actually get a neat matrix expression for the gradient. And the expression, if I'm not mistaken, is 2a uh, transpose a x minus b. Maybe I'm off. Let me see. Let me just see that I have the, the right expression. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. So it's actually, the gradient has a very neat matrix expression. Now, if we want to find a minimum of a function, and this is now a multidimensional function, okay, x is in Rn, okay, what we can do is we can say, all right, no problem, we'll just do delta the nabla f of x equals zero, okay? So we'll equate this thing to zero. So two a transposed ax minus b equals zero. Okay, this is a zero vector, this guy. All right. And then, you know, just uh, cancel away this guy and do some rearranging. And you get a transposed ax uh, equals um, a transposed b. Okay. And these equations, I think I already named them last week. What's the name of these equations? These are equations where the unknown is x. Did we name them? The normal equations. The normal equations. And we can also get to them by projections, by the way. But now we're doing it via the gradient. And I, I want to go through this quickly, and I'll actually go through this one more time next week mathematically just a bit more, but I actually want to get us to the application. The application is data free, okay? Because I promised after the quiz, we've got to do applications. Okay, so how do we solve these equations? Well, let's just multiply by the inverse of A transposed A, and that inverse will exist if uh, A is skinny full rank, okay? That's what you did with uh, voila in the practical uh, last week, or two weeks, not, not two weeks ago, okay? So then x, and let me write it, x hat equals a transposed a inverse times a transposed b. And this guy is our a dagger. So basically the a dagger, the, I'm just afraid to misspell the name, more Penrose pseudo inverse, When you took, you started with a system of equations ax equals b, you multiplied on the left by a dagger and you got x hat equals a dagger b, right? So take this system, so look, I'm gonna do it, ax equals b, 
I'll multiply on the left by a dagger. Let me write it differently. I'll do a dagger times a dagger b. Okay. And then what I have here is x equals a dagger b because a dagger times a, see when you have the a dagger is this guy. When you multiply it by a, you just get the identity. So a dagger is a left inverse <coughs> and it's a pseudo inverse and it is what minimizes this sum of squares. Now, of course, when you're minimizing, let's, let's, let's just when know this for other cases where we, when you're minimizing. All we had here, this equation to zero, this is what we call the first order conditions. Okay, so in other conditions, you actually want to see that this is indeed a minimum, just like you did, and some of you did this with me in mass, uh, or, or with Hamid in mass 7501, some of you did this elsewhere before, when you're minimizing a function, you're equating the derivative to zero. Well, that the derivative equals zero. Well, it might be an inflection point, or it might be a maximum, or it might be a minimum. Okay, but um, the there should be further conditions, and these conditions should be the second order conditions. And we look at these in a, in a few weeks when we get there. Okay, but these functions actually have a global minimum, and and I plotted one last week uh, in two dimensions. They actually they they just look like a quadratic function. And this is how you find this minimum. Okay, so that, that, that looks all, all nice and great, but how do we do uh, data fitting with it? How do we do data fitting? Um, so I'm, I'm gonna explain now how to use, I mean, this is in general for over-determined system of equations. Now you know the way to do it. You multiply by the left by a dagger, okay? And that doesn't solve the system of equations, but it gets, gives you the best solution in terms of minimizing this uh, norm square, ax minus b, okay? So that's one way of getting the solution. So let's see how we're gonna use this for data, okay? And uh, now we're doing least squares, and there's a whole chapter for that in VLMS, VMLS, least squares data fitting, okay? And I'll start with a simple situation. And the simple situation is when we have just one dimensional data, okay? So let's now call this, I'm gonna, so we're, we're go, you might get a bit confused, but that's okay, but you won't really be confused. Let's call this X and let's call this Y. Well, I mean, that's clearly not confusing, but it's not gonna agree with the X that's here, with the X that's here. That's okay, okay? And now let's put a few data points. So here's a data point. Here's a data point, here's a data point, here's a data point, here's a data point. Okay, and maybe here's a data point. Okay. Um, and I'm also, when we're doing data fitting, sometimes we use the notation differently than what we're doing here. So, you know, here A was M by N, here we're actually gonna say N data points. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to fit a straight line through this data points, and all of you have seen this in different ways. Uh, this is not a good straight line to fit. Um, you know, this one is not so good. Uh, this one is probably pretty good, okay? Now, what makes it good? Well, one way to measure the goodness of this line is to take these deviations from each data point to the line, okay? These deviations. And what we want is we don't want any point to deviate too much. And the criterion which happens to work both well practically and computationally is least square. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this point and we're gonna compute the square. So this is, we're gonna take this deviation, we're gonna compute the square, you see? These guys, these are squares. This is a little square. This point was really lucky, okay? These are squares. So then the sum of these squares is the, what, the, the, what we would want to minimize. Because if, if I was to pick a different line, like, uh, like this uh, orange line, then you know this, this, for example, here will be, just take this one as an example, it's going to be a huge square. Okay, so this deviation is going to be big. All right? So we're paying quadratically for, I'm going to erase now this bad line. We're paying quadratically for uh, deviations from the line. I mean, if all the points happen to be on, on one line, then of course we can get the sum of squares to be zero. Okay. All right. So 
The way we can do this is we can parameterize this line. Let's parameterize it by uh, beta zero plus beta one x. Okay, again, this is not the linear algebra x. This is a data fitting x. X is just this point, okay? X is, I don't know, X is your uh, weight and Y is your height. Maybe my weight and my height. I don't know. You, well, all of us. We've got five of us. Okay? More than five we have. But that's good. Okay, so B0 plus B1X, that's going to be on. So what we're looking is for a B0 and a B1 that minimize uh, the sum of squares. Well, we can pose this in the language that we saw how to solve before. We want to uh, minimize the uh, squared uh, error for AX equals B. So let's do this. So let's make our matrix A, look what I'm gonna do with the matrix A. I'm gonna put in matrix A, I'm gonna put here a one, 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 one. Now in statistics, you call this matrix the design matrix sometimes. And now these points here, each point here is a tuple. So each point here, like this point is a point X2 comma Y2. This is a point X3 comma Y3. This is a point X4 comma Y4, etc. They're not necessarily ordered, but they're the points, okay? So the, I'm gonna take the X coordinates and I'll do X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. All right, we do this. And what we want is we want here now a two vector and we want to equate this to y1, y2, y3, y4, y5. Look, we've got five equations. The equations are we would like for the line beta zero plus beta one x to equal y1 and we'd like for the line beta uh, zero plus beta uh, one x two to be y2 etc etc okay so we've got five equations so each data point induces an equation what do i put here beta zero and beta one Perfect. Okay. So here, these red guys are the thing. Let me do them purple so just to be consistent with what's above. These beta zero and beta one are the unknowns. They're what we're going to seek for in data fit. Okay. When you're doing, when you're dealing with data, this matrix is known. It's a design matrix. This is sometimes you can call these your features. Okay, now features is where you only have a single feature, the weight. Okay, but you have another feature, which is the ones feature. It's like the constant feature. And these, what do you call these? If I call these the features, what do I call these guys? What do I call these guys? If these are the features, does anybody know? The output, that would be my one thing. Okay, so you, you just had not seen that thing yet, yeah, that's often called the labels. That's what it's called in machine learning, the response, right? The response, etc. But in, in machine learning, it's called the features and labels, okay? So you stick your features and you put them here and you stick your labels and you put them there and you, and you create the design matrix in this very specific way, okay? All right. Now, what is this? There's some discussion about B0, B1, 1, 2. No, B0, B1, this is just a, this is just a two by one vector. It's a two vector, okay? So you can, this thing multiplies by this. So multiply out the first row. The first row says beta zero, one plus beta one X1 equals Y1. Now we would have loved to have this, but no, it's probably not gonna happen because you know, it's only gonna be approximately, okay? It's only going to, and similarly up to the fifth row, it's going to be beta zero one plus beta five x five is going to be approximately equal to y five. <coughs> if all of these y's exactly lie on one line, then that means that they lie in the column space of this design matrix. And then, you know, you can match these equations exactly. And then your least squares error, the sum of squares is zero. Okay, but otherwise not. Okay, 
So the nice thing, this was just five, but of course you can do now, you know, you can, you can instead of five, you can do like a lot, a lot of points, a lot of points. You're still gonna have just beta zero, beta one. And you're gonna have a lot, a lot of labels, okay? You have up to n points. So it's common to call in statistics, the dimensions are common n by p. So n is a number of observations and p is a number of variables or, or, or features, okay? So you've got the constant variable, v1, and you've got the other one, the x, okay? So we've got the system of equations. We're back now to the story, a beta equals y. Before it was a x equals b, okay? But that's okay. So, you know, we know now how to solve beta hat. Beta hat is going to be the more Ponrope pseudo inverse times y. Okay, or if we write that explicitly, it's a transposed a inverse a transposed times y. And that beta hat minimizes the sum of squares. Now, in homework two, uh, you're going to go through the uh, slightly painful task, but, uh, but, uh, but an important one to actually, you see, when you have in this specific case where n equal, where p equals two, you know, and your design matrix is then just a column vector of ones and the observations x1 through xn, then you can actually compute explicitly the poor, uh, the more Ponrope pseudo inverse Okay, and you get this kind of expression that has sum of xi squared and la, 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 la. And then you can actually compute this thing explicitly. And these are like the explicit formulas for li simple linear regression. Okay, you're gonna have that in, in, uh, in homework too. Okay, so it's, it's like, it's, it's kind of this tedious computation. Keep in mind this, this gram matrix, what's the dimension of this gram matrix? What's the dimension of A transpose A? In this, when this is, uh, when this is uh, um, uh, n by two. What's the dimension of A transpose A? It's just a two by two matrix, okay? And you know, you, you know how to invert a two by two matrix explicitly. So this is how you get like an explicit solution, okay? But this works in general, this works in general. And that is least squares data fitting. So I'm quite sure that most data scientists, if they're asked, if they're given, uh, you know, if, 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 if everything will be erased from their head, except for one specific thing, they'll say, oh, please, please, just, oh, just don't, don't take it. Don't take away least squares data fitting. I love least squares data fitting. I cannot do without it. And the thing is that it, it existed for uh, 220 years. Okay. So that's the idea of least squares data fitting. So let's see it a bit with Julia. Are there any questions on, on this guy, on this uh, notepad before I, I leave? Julia? Okay. So we're here on... Hey, Yannick. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got a fairly, fairly naive question, but I, you know, given that we have all these tools to do least squares for us, can you give us an example of, of why it's important to know this level of detail in terms of, I, mean, I know it is, I'm confident it is, but I'm just curious. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, great question. I mean, so in, indeed, you know, we're living in a world of, of plug and play, right? I mean, we press buttons and we, and we do plug and play. But um, with actually with, with designing things in terms of least squares data fitting, often you almost want to do it almost manually because it's, because it's quicker. Because, you know, your plug and play tools, they come with all this extra addition. Like, I don't know if you've run GLM in, in uh, R, um, you know, or, or LM in R, you know, or you've done this in data 7001, you know. So you get all this extra stuff. But actually, just knowing what the, how the least square uh, works is important. Uh, in other settings, if you're working in, slight, in a slightly more engineering context, maybe you want to do something that's not just fitting a, um, a line or a hyperplane, as we'll see soon, through a cloud of points. Maybe you want to, say, minimize uh, the points around an ellipse. Okay, so you know there's an ellipse. You want to minimize the points around the ellipse. So kind of understanding the concept of least square data fitting is, is central. Um, now, the, the fact is that, that 
all trained statisticians, I'm not talking about data scientists, I'm talking about statistics, because data scientists you have an industry of all sorts. So some, some use very complex things without diving directly into what's happening uh, in, in the inner workings. But all trained statisticians actually know this well because it's kind of at the heart of, of, of linear models. Okay, so that's, that's in a sense the, the reason. Right, and uh, yeah, and linear algebra in general, when you go to other methods in machine learning, linear algebra just, I mean, uh, that's how we kind of designed the course. We're showing you a whole bunch of kind of machine learning uh, and, and data science applications. Uh, you, you need to kind of understand the basics of what's happening there. Uh, I mean, you, you don't have to, but then you, you go to something like PCA and it's not exactly clear what's this dimension reduction with PCA. Things like that. Okay, I hope this kind of helps the, the motivation. Uh, in general, it's a theme in, in the program here at UQ that we're going uh, slightly deeper. Um, also under the belief, so I'll, I'll, I'll justify it one last time. So, so there's also this kind of belief that if you, if you go, go a bit more into the fundamentals, uh, then you're gaining an education that's really long lived. Um, a decade and a half ago, everybody knew what least squares was and knew the details, but nobody knew what, uh, deep neural networks or, or just some specialists, you know, right? And today everybody knows how to press a button for deep neural networks, but maybe in a decade, there'll be a different tool that's, that's more powerful, but still we're kind of getting into the fundamentals so you could, uh, you could go into these tools with, with kind of strength. I hope that kind of justifies that. Um, okay. Um, all right, so here, here is an example. Uh, by the way, now here, just so you know, what I'm, this notebook here, it'll, it'll, be in, it'll be in Jupyter, it'll be in the GitHub, but you can also reach it from, um, if you go to last year's course, so if you go to last year's course, and this was quite late in the course, uh, I created a video related to this notebook. So if you see fit, uh, watch this video here, okay? So that's in last year's course, this video dealing with least squares. Least squares come, came later in the course last year. Okay. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly until we reach the least squares, but just so we kind of uh, see, see what's it about. So, so we're not speaking about data fitting uh, yet. Uh, we're just speaking about a, a 10 by three matrix. We're still using the notation N and M. Okay, so it's a, it's a, oh, maybe I mixed it here. Okay, but that doesn't matter. Okay. Oh, okay, here I called, here I called it N by N. Okay, so it's a matrix, it's some arbitrary matrix, so it's just repeatable because we do random uh, seeds, so we set the seed to be zero, so it'll always be the same matrix. Okay, and here's some arbitrary right-hand side, okay? Um, so we need to be very lucky uh, for this right-hand side to actually fall in the range or the column space of this matrix, right? I mean, because the dimension of this subspace spanned by this column is uh, three, but it's living in 10 dimensional spaces, okay? So we need to be very lucky. So first let's just engineer this luckiness. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a, and take a different, this T is like B tilde, it's gonna be some linear combination of the columns of A. You know, these are arbitrary, the 0 0.3, the minus five and the four. These are, these are the first column of A, second column of A, the third column of A. This guy is like a linear combination of the column of A, okay? So if we would like to, for example, so now we know this BT is actually spanned by the columns of A, you know, so this BT has the, the system of equations AX equals B exactly has a solution for this BT. It doesn't for, most probably it doesn't for this B, okay? <coughs> now, one way we can uh, solve this is let's, let's take just the first three equations. So this here, what I'm highlighting is just the first three equations, right? Rows one to three of A, the first three equations, take the inverse of that, multiply by the first three elements of BT, and let's call this our X. And you know, then X we've retrieved here, look, we've retrieved the 0 0.3, the minus five, and the four, with a bit of numerical error there. So of course, AX minus BT in this case is going to be, whoops, uh, well, after I do run this X, AX minus BT is going to be all zeros, okay? Or I could do the, uh, 
the norm of uh, a x minus b t, and it's it's going to be a very small, norm, basically zero. Okay, so we've solved this this thing, uh, but of course you know we're we're not so lucky uh, because if we, for example, just take the first what we're doing here is taking now we're going to the original b. Okay, we're going back to this b, this random b. Okay. I'm back to this original B. And here we're only use first three equations. Okay. So this is like saying, hey, I'm a data scientist. I'm only going to take the first three guys. I'll make sure they fit and I'll do an X. So then when you do AX minus B, you see the first three uh, errors are zero, but the other ones are certainly not zero. Okay. And so the, this way of data fitting, this is called the uh, cast system. It's not really called that, but it's called the cast system way of data fitting, which is, hey, those first three guys, they're the top class, we're going to fit them. The other equations, we're not going to fit them. Okay. And we've got big errors. Okay. So instead, as we said, we try to minimize AX minus B or similarly AX minus B squared. So the, the value of this is not like the value of that but the minimizer is the same. Now, the thing is that since the time of MATLAB, and that's, uh, um, that exists still in Julia, the backslash operator that solves system of equations also solves least squares. So if you do x hat a backslash b, what you did, this solved the least squares equivalent to multiplying by the pseudo inverse. Okay. That's, that's what it did. Okay. So basically, this x hat, which is here, this is the, now some people would call this the least square solution, but just keep in mind, it's a solution to the optimization problem. It's not the solution to the system of equations. Because if I now do ax hat, minus b, then, you know, what we're getting here are the deviations. Well, we see though, there, we, didn't, we didn't manage to fit all the equations exactly. So there's a question, what if the data set is quite large, which causes can't input all data as a matrix in one try Input part data are meaningful, might be input all data. Great question. So there's a question, what if there's so many, what if there's so many equations, the data set is so large that we can't do it all? Well, there's something called recursive least squares, okay, which deals with doing, handling this and getting one more, you can get kind of one more chunk of data or one more system of, a, one more line of the matrix A and B and adapting the least square solutions you go. And, and I think one of the projects deals with that, but it's still not for the scope today. So recursive least squares, look at that. Okay, now let's look what's the loss. So this is, we, here we see that x hat is just an approximate solution, okay? It's not even good for many, but keep in mind, this was quite a tough situation. We had here 10 equations and three unknowns, okay? And we picked kind of this big range. I mean, you know, we, we can't expect to, to, to have a good fit, okay? So the, the norm of ax minus b is the loss here, okay? Now, just to kind of, if I'm telling you that this is the best loss, I mean, at this point, you're just relying on believing me or believing the mathematics that, you know, that these first order conditions that the normal equations, A transposed AX equals A uh, transposed B, okay, were solved using these squares, but you don't really know. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna search locally, this is a stupid thing to do, but it's not a bad exercise, okay? I'm just gonna take this x hat, which we took, this point. This is a point in three-dimensional space, this x hat. And I'm going to search around it, okay? This is something that you can always do. You know, if I tell you some point is the best, then what you know, and this, this point, I actually hold it, it's here, it's here in, the, in my room, okay? So I can actually, you know, I can, I can move around this point and I know that wherever I move, the loss will be worse. Okay, that's at least the meaning of it's the best. That means that it's a local minimum. Okay, uh, you know, maybe there's a different point very far that's, that's better, but actually with least squares, we're guaranteed that the local minimum is a global. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move around this point a bit randomly and see that the loss that I get around this point, and I can't plot this because this is a point in three dimensional space, x hat is three dimensional space. So I'm going to, and you know, it could have been, by the way, 20 dimensional space, but with three, I could still hold it. You see, here it is. Okay, there it is. So I'm going to move it around, and wherever I move it around, I'll, I'll compute the loss, and I'll, I want to make sure that the loss that I get is bigger than this. 130.2394, okay? This number is rather arbitrary, but that's the least squares loss, okay? So the way we're doing it is here, and I won't get into all the details because I want, I want to just advance a bit, but basically these two matrices, R1 theta and R2 theta, they're like rotation matrices with theta in three-dimensional space. You, you guys know rotation matrices already, right? So, so give me an angle theta and I'll produce this rotation matrix that only rotates on the x, y axis. And then give me another angle theta and I'll, and I'll rotate on the x, z axis. Okay, that's what these rotation matrices do. Okay. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get random points, like random angles, uniform two pi, okay? So I'll rotate from my point like randomly with a random uni uniform zero two pi like any possible direction for the theta one and any possible direction for the theta two. <coughs> so that's kind of from a point, I'm going to kind of point in some different direction. And then I'm going to do 20 times a random exponential, random exponent, exponential distribution is just a distribution that kind of, kind of goes like this and has uh, infinite support. So it's, and, and it has a mean of one when you do this rand exp, okay? So I'll do 20 times and there'll be a radius. So basically then I'll take my point and it'll be the best point plus uh, this, these two transformations, these two linear transformations applied to uh, multiplied by the radius by kind of the, the unit vector of that radius. Okay, so I'm taking, this is basically random angle and random radius. Okay, and these gives me, this is how I'm gonna get points that are around my point. Okay. That's just a, a thing to see. And I'm going to push to an array of points, uh, this point and its loss. And I'll say, if I actually found that the loss of this other point is, is better than the loss of, of my best point, then found something better, but this won't happen. Okay? I mean, it'll happen if there's some error with the map or something like that, okay? And the losses is uh, the last of this, and, and you know, I can, can run this. And it tells me the uh, minimum loss we got, uh, minimum explored loss was 100, was pretty close, okay? But the optimum is still low. Okay, uh, two, three, nine, four, oh, seven, five. I mean, the reason that this is like this is because we, we explored closely, okay? But it's not like we went to a point and we suddenly saw something better. If you are not at a minimum point, if you are not at a minimum point, so just if I was like, before, uh, let's instead of x hat, I'll do I'll do x hat plus uh, 0 0.0100. 0, 0. Let's just move away from that minimum point. Then I think it'll probably tell us. Um, let's move, you know, 0 0.05 or something. It'll tell us found something better. So I do. We didn't find something better, but let's. Oh, um, sorry. Um, no, I mean but I also need to add this loss here. And then I'll tell us probably, you know, it found better points. You see, it's finding better points because this is not the best point, okay? Uh, so I don't know if to delete this or not, so I'll just, I'll just put it as a comment. Um, it's, it's, okay. Okay, this is so far doesn't have much linear algebra uh, happening going on. It's just showing you um, kind of conceptually how to see that a point is a, is a, is a, is a local minimum at least. And it, it, it doesn't hurt to actually plot the distribution of that. This is kind of a, a density plot that comes from stat plots. That's like a kernel density estimation. It's not something we're teaching here, but uh, it's in this course, 
it's just like a smooth histogram, okay? So you see that this is kind of the distribution of the loss around the point. Of course, you get something very close to the point, and here you get kind of four. Okay, and here's even a movie that, uh, that does this, and I'll skip this so you can look at this code. So what this movie does is, is this is now our optimal point, okay? This is our optimal point, and the points that we explored are like around this point and all of them have worse loss and, and you're seeing them kind of grow according to with time you see that all you see how the loss grows so the minimum loss is 130 it'll be at that one point but now we're exploring farther and farther and we're seeing points with greater and greater loss okay this is just a way for you to think about what a minimum looks like in three dimensions you cannot visualize minimum in three dimensions you can just kind of maybe try to do movies or colors or things. So here we have it, the center of the universe, this point. Okay. <clears throat> now, we could have gotten there also uh, via gradient descent. So gradient descent is this idea, which I think we'll need to speak about more in later times. Uh, but basically it says, let's do an algorithm where every time this we do this gradient descent step. It's also one of your topics uh, for the project. Uh, so we'll analyze gradient descent more. And, and this is kind of central to modern uh, machine learning, okay? It's a simple algorithm. What gradient descent does is it says, at each point, at each iteration, your point X was the point X that you had, minus some eta, and eta is gonna be something small. This is some, sometimes what we call the learning rate, okay? Multiplied by the gradient, okay? Remember, this is a gradient. This guy. Okay, so what you're doing is you're you're and you're taking steps in the opposite direction of the gradient, small small steps, and you know so this is how people would solve huge least squares problems or machine learning problems, often not using the pseudo inverse, but rather using gradient descent by kind of iteratively moving. That's that's one way of doing it. And here's you you can actually see. This is now a history of the gradient descent. What you're, what you're seeing is it's kind of, in three dimensions, we, we started here with some arbitrary point. We started with a point X, this is an initial point. Arbitrary. We didn't know where, where we started. And we start with some X. And every time we, we took little, little steps, and here you see we start with this X, and we took these steps, until we reached our optimal point, okay? Um, at first, the yeah, that's what happened. Okay, so the gradient uh, becomes smaller and smaller in magnitude, and that's why the points get closer. So this is how like a gradient descent would move us now. Okay, so this is kind of the a a, a different view of this uh, least square. So far, not data fitting. Now, of course. Now we'll get back to the normal equation. So the gradient is this guy. And if we equate it to zero, we have our normal equations. And then if A transposed A is non-singular, which happens if A is a skinny full rank, then we can multiply by uh, the inverse here and get the more pan rope pseudo inverse, right, times B. Okay. So I remind you, this is what our X hat was. Now you actually have pseudo inverse, you know, A transpose A in times A transpose, okay? P inv does a pseudo inverse. And here is, so P inv is, you know, you can do a question mark on P inv that comes with linear algebra. So it computes a pseudo inverse. It doesn't do it exactly by doing what, uh, what, what I'm doing here, but it's, this is what the formula means when this is a pseudo inverse formula when A transpose A is invertible. Okay, so here's the documentation. You can read it for the pseudo inverse. All right. So here I'm computing the pseudo inverse manually, you know, inverse of A transpose A times A transpose and see that the pseudo inverse is the same. Look, the pseudo inverse is, in this case, it takes our it takes our 10, uh, length 10 right hand side and returns our three or X hands. That's the three by 10 matrix. So if you do pseudo inverse uh, times B, you get again the X hat. Okay. 
So this is, remember the way we got the x hat the first time was by doing, just using the, this is like the black box tool, the, you know, the not, not knowing exactly what's happening inside tool. This is how we got x hat, just by using the backslash operator. Okay, this is not a linear algebra thing. This is a Julia thing inherited from MATLAB. Okay. So once we've got that here, let's just have another look at different ways just to write. This is, you know, solve the normal equations. So the normal equations are A transposed A times X equals A transposed B. We can do this and we also get our X hat. Okay, so all these are different ways of getting X hat. Okay. All right. So we now this I will actually cover next week. We we spoke about it briefly. So getting this via QR uh, because I want to get to the data fitting, and we'll come back to this notebook after about three four weeks when we speak about SVD single va singular value decomposition because we'll see how to represent A as a singular value decomposition, just like a QR decomposition. Uh, and this is powerful in several ways, but I'm going to I'm going to skip these bits. I'm going to skip these bits, and I'm going to go to the data fitting bit. Okay. Okay. So let's go to data fitting. So some reality. Now this reality really requires quotes because there's nothing realistic about this reality. Okay. We're going to make up some data. <coughs> so the reality function, it's the made up data. Let's assume that nature for us has found this relationship between money invested and long-term return. Okay, money invested and long-term return. In the relationship, of course, we don't know this, okay, but that's kind of how, let's say, nature put this. I mean, there's always, we assume that there's something in nature that we don't really know when we're learning about it. So this is, you know, this is mother nature. I mean, the nature of business. This is business context, money invested long-term return. So we think that if the money invested is X and you add 250 plus 30 X, that's a linear term. But there's also like a term which is, it's not even a quadratic term. It's like X to the power 1.8. You see, it's giving this thing a bit of curvature. You see, let's say that's what we see. Uh, plus 2000 times random normal, there's some normal noise around it. Okay, and let's say that there's 50 data points and the X values uh, and the money invested are just going to be uh, 100, uh, like they start at the time 100 plus 400 times, uh, so they're gonna spread this range up to 500, okay? And then the Y values are reality applied to man, uh, money invested. Notice the broadcast operator there. Okay, and then that's our, that's our data. Now let's do some least squares data fitting for this data. Okay, so I'm actually, before I get to what's here below, I'm just gonna fit a line through this cloud of points. Okay, I'll fit a line through this cloud of points. Uh, stop if there's any questions. So I'm gonna call A the matrix, it'll be the, let's make our own design matrix. Let's fit a straight line. And this is the design matrix. So what the design matrix will have, it'll have ones for n. Okay, remember that's what I had on the notebook on the notepad a bit before that. And then it'll have the x values, right? The x values are all the x coordinates of this. I mean, we know the data. It's going to have x values. Let's see how this goes. This is going to be our design matrix. Okay, so it's a fifty by two design matrix. And then what we can do is we can do beta hat is, I'll just do it manually just for the fun. I'll do A times A transposed A times A transposed times the Y vels. And there we go, there we go, that's a beta hat. So, so this, this now did simple linear regression. So this was an intercept at minus 13,000, okay? I mean, look, this is two to the power four. This is all kind of huge numbers, minus 13,000. And the slope is 100, at, at, at 161. Let's actually plot this, just to plot this line. So what I'm gonna do is then I'll, I'll 
think we can do this. So let's then, then do a, a, a plot. Okay, how do we do this? So we do a plot exclamation mark to add to the plot. So the x coordinates of the plot will be uh, zero comma. Oh, so let's let's actually create a prediction function. Okay, so let's make pred of x is going to be uh, beta at one plus uh, beta at two of x uh, times x. This is how this is how th this prediction function works. Okay, so for example, if I do, let's just see this. Let's just do pred at 300. If the money invested is 300, see this is four times 10 to the four roughly. Let's see what it gives us. It gives us uh, 35,000, okay? So now when we plot, let's do zero time, uh, uh, the coordinates will be zero 500 and pred of zero, of 500. I think that should work. And label equals uh, line fit. So, let's see if that works. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So here we fit a line through this cloud of points. Is this the best we can do? Just stop me, by the way, if there are any questions. I, it's very, you might be very tired from the quiz, which is understandable. Looks pretty good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it looks good, but if we would plot the residuals, so we'd see that there's kind of a, uh, we're underfitting here, here we're overfitting, and here we're kind of fitting well, okay? Then we might say, ah, maybe there's a bit of a relationship. Now, no data scientist in her right mind will look at this and say, oh yes, it's a, uh, it's a X to the power 1.8 relationship, okay? I mean, you know, we know this because we, 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 we played make-believe God here, Mother Nature, but we don't know what X to the power one, one minus eight. But what would, what would you think? What, what relationship would we fit? You'd, put, you'd add another term. You'd add a quadratic relationship, okay? You might want to do a quadratic relationship. So, so now let's do, let's go quadratic. What does that mean? That means that, that we have a, let me actually go up and, and write it in. Yes, so our one will do it marked up. Okay, so the model is going to be beta zero plus beta one x plus beta two x squared. Okay, that's going to be the model. So, what's going to be the design matrix? of the design matrix in this case. What is, what is the design matrix? Before we had two unknowns, beta zero, beta one. Now we have three. What are the dimensions of it? I mean, the, we have here the observations we have are n observations. So what are the dimensions of the design matrix? It still starts with a, a one, x1, x2. Okay, these are the three features, right? So we have a one's n. We have an x vals, and then uh, for this third column, we'll put x vals squared. This squares each each of the x vals. You see? So let's look at this design matrix. You see, this is now the new design matrix. Okay. All right. So we've had the x vals and the x vals squared. So now let's repeat our data fitting and, and the, the code here will be actually the same. So the beta hat, um, let's do this. Let's call it new beta hat is still this, okay? Only now the gram matrix here is not two by two, but the gram matrix is three by three. Okay, so the new beta hat, we've now got these, these new beta hat. Okay, so this is now, you see, this is the, now notice when you do this, the coefficient, the intercept, the beta zero, which we had before was minus 13,000 and a bit. Okay, now it's 891. 
And the beta one, which has a very important relationship, I and mean, beta one has a meaning, if I increase money invested by one unit, then the long-term return grows by 161. Ooh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Better invest. Okay, 161. Okay, so now, now, but now the beta one changes. It changed to 41 because there's also a quadratic term involved. Okay, that's a beta two. Let's make our new prediction function and I'll finish just on time, I hope. So the new pred, let's call this new pred. Oh, and here below is pretty much what, what we're doing. Uh, that's from the old notebook, but, but um, you, could, you could continue reading this below later on, but I'm just doing it manually. The new pred X is going to be the new beta hat. Um, so let's write it in a linear algebraic way now. It's new beta hat, inner product with one, x and x squared okay that's this is an inner product okay of new beta hat by by one one x squared okay so for example let's see before we had the prediction at 300 and we got 35,000 right 300 we've got 35,000 let's see what we get now so the new prediction this predictor that has a quadratic model uh, oh, doesn't like it. Times maybe one at times here. Yeah, it, it it didn't like to do this when this is like a matrix without a when this is a vector like whatever. We need the times. So you see, we got thirty one thousand six hundred. Okay, so before we were at thirty five thousand. Now we went to thirty one thousand uh, because. We kind of we we're catching that belly. So let's plot this. Let's plot and see how this fits. So now to plot this here, I did like um, I just did, you know, here when I plot the line, I just plotted two points. Only plotted two points. But if I'm plotting this parabola, I can't just plot two points. I need to kind of plot the whole thing, right? Uh, I mean, there are different ways to do it, but let's let's see how I do it now. So. Let's call the X plot points. Uh, let's just take a grid from zero. I think steps of one would be good because it's just, this is so small. So zero to 500. So then when we plot, we plot here, the X plot points and the Y coordinate, this is even more evident, is a predictor mapped or broadcasted to X plot points. Okay, so. And this is now uh, parabola fit, second uh, two uh, second order fit. That didn't seem to, uh, because what, why is it doing this? There's a bug, why is this? New prod, well done. Okay, new prod. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Maybe, I don't know, I don't know if it excites you. Um, so just to finish up, let's call this a second order fit and, and let's, let's just do the plot of the pred before and do this the first order. And um, legend true. So we've got both the first order fit and the second. All right. So yeah, you can do a whole lot with least squares. You can fit a parabola through points. Uh, we'll speak about this more. This is this is a central theme for uh, the course because um, if you look here at you know uh, least squares data fitting we just did, there's going to be least squares classification, multi-objective least squares, many least squares. Um, any questions before we go to sleep? No. Yeah, assignment two will be out uh, in two days. It'll be discussed in the practical already. Um, and you have a month for it.
Uh, so it's due, I, I fix this. It's not September 15, October 15. Okay, according to the course profile. Uh, so there's a question, if you transfer the data into some other dimensions and do least squares, would it be more precise? Um, yeah, so the whole concept of, of generalized linear models, which we're not speaking about uh, here, is about doing transformations in different ways. But it's not into other dimensions. It's, 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 it's kind of doing these nonlinear transformations on, on the data in different ways. Um, sometimes it's kind of obvious what you want to do. You sometimes want to do a log transformation or something else. Um, now, we, we need to be careful. The, this, I might return to this notebook. So you can continue and add more and more polynomial terms and get kind of a per perfect fit. But of course, you know, we need to be careful with perfect, perfect fits because then we're overfitting. So maybe our model, which we get, very much fits uh, the data, but that doesn't fit the real world. And finding the balance between uh, overfitting and underfitting is really uh, one of the tricks of the trade. Any other thoughts? Okay, and just so you know, so the solution to the quiz, sorry, oh, you guys wanted to get some rest and now I'm telling you the solution is here. You can, you, you don't have to waste time on it because you'll, uh, you'll see it also in, um, in the practical. But the solution is now online. So thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you.